Hello, and we'll just wait until a few more join us, and then we'll begin our annual meeting. It looks like most of our group has joined us. So uh, Carolyn Rizza, our still relatively new board chair, could kick us off for our meeting today. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I hope that you are glad that you're here. Uh, I'm Carolyn Rizza and the chair of the board. And it's a wonderful, beautiful day. I wish we were outside. Uh, and had opportunities to hike. We, I don't know whether uh, any of you were able to hike uh, on Saturday at Jennings. It was so great to be in the woods and see all the ephemerals coming up. And hopefully next year we will be back at the barn where we can see each other in person and uh, go on hikes and look at exhibits and buy plants. Um, there will be a plant sale, uh, the same person that sells the plants at our annual meeting on the 4th of March in Ohio Pile, if you'd like to go buy some plants there. But next year, we're hoping that everything will be back to normal. I think everybody hopes that. So I'm pleased to introduce Tom Saunders, who will pro uh, provide an overview and an update of the Conservancy's work and programs during the past year. Uh, along with annual program staff after that, who will update us on the activities and special interests during the, the past year. And so we're looking forward to hearing um, how the Conservancy has been faring and what they've been doing in the last year. Uh, after that, we will have our official uh, business meeting uh, that will follow. So we will talk to you then. Tom? Carolyn, thank you very much. As Carolyn said, I'm Tom Saunders, I'm President and CEO of the Conservancy. And I wanna just give a very quick overview of some of the projects that we've had underway during the last year. And the first thing I just wanna say is that we couldn't have done them without all of your support. We appreciate um, the enthusiasm and the, uh, the, the volunteer time and the participation and the funding and all the things that you all have brought to us that have allowed us to do these projects. And so I'll tell you first about a few of the land protection projects that we've done over the last 12 months. Um, this one is uh, a beautiful acquisition. It's a set of nine, nine islands in the French Creek watershed. French Creek, as most of you know, is north of Pittsburgh. It's up in the Allegheny River watershed. And uh, these nine islands are a little bit um, west of uh, Franklin. And then uh, Matt Marusiak, who will be speaking in a minute, has uh, done this project, which was really an acquisition of two different properties on the First Fork Cinema Honing Creek in Potter and Cameron counties. And this particular one is a, a key wetlands where, I mean, a key uh, headwaters where two of the small streams that form the First Fork come together on this, this property. It's a really wonderful acquisition. And then Matt also did um, a conservation easement on a very beautiful property on a small stream called Bell Run, and that one's in Clearfield County. And then we have continued our long heritage of land protection work along the Clarion River, and you'll hear a, a more full presentation about this in a minute, because we transferred a really wonderful property into the Allegheny National Forest. And we'll let Matt tell that story more, more fully shortly. We have continued to do um, scenic protection work along the Great Allegheny Passage. So this is a 50 acre um, conservation easement that we acquired to protect view along the, the Gap Trail. And then Michael Noop and our staff worked on this um, acquisition, which was hundred acres up on a important ridge line in Bedford County. And this property was acquired by us and then transferred over to the state game lands for an addition to their properties there. So that's a sampling of the land acquisitions we've done since the last annual meeting, but we also try to help out the other land trusts. And so we have a revolving fund where we make loans out to them. And this is just a very beautiful property protected by the Somerset County Conservancy. And uh, they were able to do that in part because we gave this loan that they will, they will repay. So 
So our gardens and green space program has been active too. And uh, they have planted 400 hanging baskets um, during the course of the last year and over 400 um, planters in downtown streets, which they changed out five different times as seasons progressed. They are doing a lot of beautiful ecological work. This is a rain garden that was created uh, in Larimer in a place where we had had a garden before, but it's done in conjunction with the local school. And it's an educational opportunity about stormwater and stormwater management for the school kids there. And then we went back to, as the pandemic waned to some degree, we went back to um, our full count of 130 gardens. During the first year of the pandemic, we had um, dropped down to 90 gardens just to reduce the, the whole operation a little bit. And um, during last year, thankfully, we had more volunteers participating with us again. Um, our staff continued to be in full mode out in the field, and we went back up to the complete count of 130 gardens. We couldn't do them without uh, the work of our volunteers, uh, for example, this group, and likewise with our tree plantings. We are up to 37,000 street trees and we work with community groups like this one in Lawrenceville to do tree plantings. And then we've also continued with our red bud project as a specific part of our urban forestry work. And with that, we're in the thousands now, red buds planted uh, along the rivers near Pittsburgh. And then lastly, we partner with the Allegheny County Park Foundation and Parks Foundation and the parks. And we have done um, ecological assessments of additional parks during this last year, uh, Round Hill and White Oak Parks, which then turn around and get implemented and, and end up being enhancements to the parks. So our natural heritage program has been hard at work during the last year also. Uh, they have continued to work on species that are in peril, like uh, um, hibernating bats across Pennsylvania, where their populations have declined so much. So we've had a role in sur surveying where the survivors are, where the resilient speakers are, resilient of species are, the ones that have survived the um, white nose syndrome, and, um, and then also looking at the kinds of habitats that work for them for survival. And then our heritage staff has worked on special habitat areas too. So they have continued to survey all the headwaters of the major river systems across Pennsylvania, um, important habitats for many species. And then they have um, studied, surveyed particular species like uh, marsh birds. This is up at Conneaut Marsh. Um, like the evening grosbeak, this is a species that has extraordinary population decline where we're not only um, surveying uh, populations, but we're monitoring them with uh, nano tagging devices that are picked up by transmitter towers. So we have information about where they migrate south and back north. And I'm showing this image because it shows how far times have come. This is Charles Beer back in the 1980s and WPC's first laptop ever. And so if you move into the present era during the last year, now our natural heritage and science staff do so much work that's technology-based, so much modeling, so much data-based um, projections that allow us to make good conservation decisions. So an example of that is that they have been examining um, the most important corridors for connectivity as we look ahead at a world with a, a warmer climate and uh, try to create the corridor connections for species to survive that. And um, then we've looked at particular places uh, where we are doing conservation work and looking at how those tie into the uh, most important corridor connections. So this is uh, the Laurel Highlands, which is just one example of a place where we have protected vast forest and where we look at all those connections to, um, so that we know that we'll be building the patterns in time that will allow species and their habitat, habitats to endure. And then we're looking at different aspects of um, climate issues and climate resilience. And one that Charles Beer is particularly focusing on this year is the sequestration potential of our forests. In other words, the ability of, um, of the trees that we protect in our forests to hold carbon and um, to help with climate change, reduce climate change impacts in that way. And for us to actually be able to score the properties for prioritization, um, keeping that in mind. And then last, I'll just mention that our natural heritage staff and our conservation science staff continue to work on endangered, I mean, 
continue to work on an invasive species. And in this case, this is uh, uh, the problem of the hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid of Bear Run and um, Charles Deere managing uh, work out there on an insectary where there will be a, a predator uh, beetle that will um, help to address the, um, the woolly adelgid issue. Our watershed staff also has um, done a great job with just a huge number of projects, notwithstanding the pandemic. So they have protected 15 miles of streams through Western Pennsylvania over the last year. They have done assessments of the kind of work that needs to be done in streams. Um, and then they turn around and work on the specific projects. And so this is one where you can see on the left, you know, a terrible erosion situation. And then on the right, the kind of stream bank um, stabilization and planting and management that our, our staff creates for a much healthier environment along the stream. Likewise, they've continued with um, tree plantings along streams. We have done, um, uh, I'm going to say many acres because I can't find my notes. We've done 32 acres of tree plantings along streams during the last year. That one was out at Warriors Run in central Pennsylvania. And then our staff continues to identify priority locations for doing projects like this one, where there is a culvert before, as in this image, where you can see that um, you know, species and water aren't going to be able to pass through there in a way that species have mobility. And it's replaced them with situations like this, where there's a big open culvert with a natural stream bottom rather than, rather than that kind of a, you know, raised pipe bottom. And, um, and through this new situation, you're able to have the species migrate um, upstream and downstream. And then I'll end with falling water. So the whole pandemic period has been interesting at falling water. It's brought the most change for us there. Uh, we've continued with modified tours during the last year, so we did reopen for interior tours. Um, but as we've done that, we've continued with somewhat smaller tour sizes and more spacing and time between tour groups. Uh, so here is a graph. Move the images on my screen so I can see it better. But here's a graph that shows um, visitation over a number of years, and it shows there at the far right the, uh, the plummet during the beginning of the pandemic and the progress we made last year as we moved back up to about 100,000 visitors last year. Oops. And as we have reduced the number of in person programs that we have done during the pandemic, we have um, correspondingly increased virtual programming. And so we've done a lot of virtual summer camps, which is what these images are. Um, and then in addition, we've continued with all kinds of preservation and renovation projects. We've worked on the parapet walls of the bridge. We've worked on the bolsters beneath the house. And then I'll end by just looking at some of the um, kind of current state of the art projects that we're doing where um, as with our science staff, our falling water staff increasingly is using um, you know, very focused technology in ways that we could not have done in the past. This is um, our staff working on uh, virtual digital archiving of the, um, the elements in falling water, the house itself and the collections. And then during the past year, we have begun to add uh, charging stations. We're introducing them first for staff and then we will for visitors. We have added solar panels in an inconspicuous spot so that we can move back into the grid the same amount of energy that we consume um, from falling water. And it's just nice to see these very state-of-the-art kind of changes taking place now. And then with everything we do, we try to include uh, education and school children and the next generation because we want to be able to look ahead and know that these kids are going to be involved in the, the kind of things we do, either as volunteers or as staff in this organization, but knowledgeable about conservation and preservation and all the work that can be done in this field. So with that, I'm gonna pass this to um, a few speakers who are going to tell us in more detail about a few specific projects. And I'm going to introduce Ashley Andrikovich who will tell us about one at Fallmore. Thanks, Tom. So as you know, Falling Water offers a variety of education programs. And today I'm going to talk about an engaging program that's intended to provide uh, new insights and perspectives of Falling Water, which is 
the Falling Water Institute Artist and Scholar in Residence Program. Falling Water's first artist in residence was Roger Tory Peterson, who was invited by Edgar Kaufman Jr. in the 1960s uh, to come to Falling Water and work on ornithological illustrations. And here you see him sitting at the partner's desk. Um, that's his wife by his side, Barbara. Um, and in front of him, he has bird specimens um, and some in progress watercolors on the desk. So um, the idea is that, um, and Edgar Kaufman Jr. knew that um, Falling Water had value to artists and scholars who are seeking for a place to um, really focus on a project or think about their process. In 2007, Falling Water hosted Spanish painter Felix de la Concha, um, whose observational paintings were shown in an exhibition at Concept Art Gallery in Pittsburgh and at the barn at Falling Water. Today, um, artists and scholars and residents enjoy exceptional access to the house and grounds, as well as a place to stay on our site. And no, they do not stay in the house. That's a question that I often receive. Um, we have housing on our site though, that they can enjoy. Um, and they do this while they gather inspiration and explore their creative process. Um, and in these photos, um, Gudmundur Thoridsson and Arna Oter's daughter, or our Iceland-based artist, and um, Stephen Towns, who I will talk about a little bit later, is in the other photo. Residency outcomes, um, they're different for each participant, and they range from exhibitions, performances, publications, workshops, works of art, um, and in this picture, meditation sessions. Um, this is Dr. Barry Curzon, who was a scholar in residence during the pandemic. Um, he is the personal physician to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and he is researching the connection between um, time spent in nature, meditation, and wellness. Um, and Dr. Curzon created a meditation video at Falling Water that is available on our YouTube channel. Um, the residency program has created opportunities for Falling Water to collaborate with other museums and organizations. We recently collaborated with Westmoreland Museum of American Art by hosting artist in residence um, Stephen Towns, and um, he was working towards a solo exhibition. Um, and here you see works in progress that he was working on in the Chateaian studio at High Meadow, and we also see um, see him with curator Kailolo Luckett in Falling Waters Collections Archive as they research the life of Elsie Henderson, who was the Kaufman's cook. Um, and here is Stephen Towns at the opening of his solo exhibition at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. The exhibition is titled Declaration and Resistance. Um, and this portrait is included. This is a portrait of Elsie Henderson, and it's currently on view. Um, the exhibition opened in January and it actually closes this weekend. This is artist Sarah Greenberger Rafferty, um, who works in both photography and glass. And her residency coincided with an exhibition at Carnegie Museum of Art. And this is a, a installation photo of that exhibition. It included um, a photography and glass fusing workshop that was presented in collaboration between Falling Water, Pittsburgh Glass Center, and Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, so some of our artists and scholars travel internationally to get to us, uh, some nationally, and we also have some artists who are local. This is Ron Donahue. He is a Pittsburgh-based artist who is creating a series of observational landscape paintings of our site. Um, and he will also lead a series of on plane air workshops starting this summer. This is photographer Andrew Peelage, who is based in Arizona. He is currently working toward photographing 500 Frank Lloyd Wright design structures. I think he's right in the middle of the process. Um, and in 2016, he photographed Falling Water. He also returns to our site annually to lead photography workshops. 
Sometimes our residencies yield practical projects. Um, so this is artist and architect Ivan Chow. He illustrated a really beautiful map and visitor guide for our site. And every visitor to Falling Water receives one of those to help with wayfinding. Um, and Chow also teaches studio-based programs at Falling Water um, for students of all ages. So during the pandemic, we hosted 13 artists and scholars in residence, too many to name and mention during this brief presentation. Um, but a lot of them have residency projects that are in the works and forthcoming. And um, one is artist Charles Lutz, um, and he will install his work inside the house this summer. This picture offers a sneak preview of one of the works in the living room. Um, you may not have noticed it, it fits in pretty well in the middle of the coffee table here. Um, so his installation will be on view at Falling Water starting on June 1st. And this image of artist Nicole Eisenman in the living room um, at night, I think gives you a glimpse of the experience that's offered to residents. Um, it's rewarding, I think, for the artists and scholars who participate. It's definitely rewarding for Falling Water staff. We get to work with them. Um, and ultimately for our visitors to our site who are invited to see Falling Water through new lenses. So now I'll hand things over to Senior Director of Community Forestry and Tree Vitalize Pittsburgh, Jeff Bergman. All right, thanks, Ashley. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Clareton Community Greening Assessment Project. And this is one of the many projects out of the Community uh, uh, Gardens and Greening Program where we work very closely with municipalities and volunteers to uh, address environmental concerns. And so while uh, we have two very straightforward ways that we work with communities to um, uh, address uh, environmental concerns, one is our community forestry work, uh, the other is green infrastructure. And these two approaches address um, two big problems in our region. One is air quality and the other is stormwater runoff. And you see this image here is a, a, the cover of our tree inventory report. And so uh, you can see our community forester here, Brian Crooks, he is a tree hugger uh, as we all are over here, but he is actually uh, collecting data. He's doing a tree inventory of all of the park trees and street trees, uh, like you see here, this large London plain. And Brian goes out and he uh, looks at the species, uh, the size of the tree, the health condition and various other things, um, and is able to provide the community and us uh, with a lot of good data. There's a lot of information that's derived from these inventories and it sets baseline data. So we think that our uh, approach with uh, you know, our greening approaches are underlined by uh, data that we have in order to make them most effective. But um, so this data helps us plan for future plantings. Uh, each one of those little plots is a GIS point that has all of the associated data with each of those park and street trees. And then we can look at things like um, it gives us lots of good information. So here we can see that we know the condition ratings of our park trees and our street trees. You can see a lot of them are in decent condition and fair. Uh, and then really good information. Uh, we use uh, the data uh, to run analysis models uh, for the trees. And we can see this data shows uh, the actual dollar value of the various environmental benefits uh, provided by the trees. And this is a great advocacy tool for um, for us to uh, demonstrate the value of community tree plantings. And then, uh, you know, with that data, we, uh, uh, it is very important, um, but we also like to get people's hands dirty. So this is an image of us planting trees in uh, Clareton, in a small uh, park in Clareton. Um, so we go out with the community volunteers and partners and, and we uh, get trees in the ground uh, to help provide all those benefits that we seek. The other thing that we do through this project, as I said, is the green infrastructure. So we want to be strategic about where we uh, in, install these types of facilities, really, and they're geared towards controlling stormwater runoff and 
helping to improve water quality. Uh, but this image shows uh, uh, the results of our hydrologic analysis. So it's basically looking at where the water is going uh, within a municipality, in this case, the city of Clareton. Um, and then we overlay that with um, community input. So we know where the water is going and where there could be places to do good places or impactful places to do green infrastructure. Uh, but we also want to hear from the community where are spaces that, you know, flooding is observed or runoff or erosion. Um, and then layering that with the data to find optimal places to uh, implement green infrastructure. And you can see here that the Clareton uh, City Park and uh, the small municipal parking lot were two uh, places that were identified as optimal to do green infrastructure. And this is a design. Uh, so we worked with our team of engineers and landscape architects um, who also helped us with the community outreach piece to make sure that whatever the work that we're doing is uh, in line with community priorities. Um, and so we uh, uh, looked at uh, doing uh, perimeter bioswales around this small municipal parking lot. So you can see where we've excavated around the perimeter of the lot and we're tying into the existing uh, sewage infrastructure that helps make these projects more affordable. So you're basically putting these stormwater, uh, these green stormwater capture facilities in front of uh, uh, sewer intakes so that you're trapping that water and cleaning it before it goes back into the system. And just like with our community tree plantings, we, uh, we involve uh, community volunteers in our green infrastructure projects. This is an image of our staff person, Sean. He is sorting a wide variety of perennial plants that will be planted in the, uh, in the bioswales. And then we coordinate volunteer events with the community. In this case, we had a youth group from the city of Clareton come out and learn about why community greening is important and how things like trees and green inf infrastructure can uh, improve the quality of life in their community. Even learn about the fact that there are people like us that have jobs that do this kind of work. Um, and so uh, that's been a really fun project. Uh, we completed a very similar project in Harrison Township up in the north part of Allegheny County. And we're currently uh, completing projects in Sharpsburg and McKeesport with the same model where we go in, we do our data analysis and we work very closely with the community. Um, in Clareton, the, the work continues. We are, um, we are installing a large green infrastructure facility, a series of rain gardens in their city park. Um, so this is an example of where we've established a relationship with the community and we continue to do uh, this greening work with them. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Andy Zadnik, who is our Director of Land Stewardship. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody. I'm going to give a brief update on our 41 Places campaign. This was a campaign that occurred over uh, later last summer. Hopefully, you all all saw our signs that we posted at our at our preserves or uh, um, on the website or mailings. So one goal of the 41 Places campaign was to bring more awareness to all of you about, about our preserves. I meant to go back one. But anyway, this, is, uh, this view here is of our White's Creek Valley natural area, which is in Somerset County. It's southeast of Confluence. It contains about 85 acres of hemlock and a mixed hard, northern hardwood forest. And it provides access to White's Creek, which is a popular trout stream, as well as a, um, it's a tributary of the Castleman River. And now, there we go, just trying to advance. This summer, we plan to install a small parking area at White's Creek. The property is a little small to encourage a lot of use, but we do wanna provide parking for four or five 
vehicle. So that's one project we have slated to occur this summer. Up at Lake Pleasant, we continue our long-term efforts to maintain and, and enhance the critical natural communities that are associated with the lake. This is a view of last summer when we had some contractors doing invasive plant control along the shoreline of the lake to control um, narrow-leaved cattail and phragmites. The project was actually featured on the, the public radio program, the Allegheny Front. In case you missed it, uh, you may still be able to, to listen to that, that story. The reporter with the program is actually sitting in the bow of the canoe with the, uh, with the microphone. See if I can advance again. There we go. Let's go back one. There. There seems to be a delay. Thanks to the 41 Places campaign, we also are continuing our efforts to restore the landscape around Lake Pleasant by removing old structures, such as this barn that we actually removed just this past December. And you can see the lake in the background of that uh, second photo, the, the after photo. And along Lake Pleasant Road, which borders the eastern side of the lake, we removed an old house and also addressed a concern we had about line of sight. The launch for the Fish and Boat Commission launch site is on the left there in the, in the photos. The parking area is a little further up the road on the right. So we wanted to not only remove the house, but also kind of slope back the, uh, the, the right of way along the road to kind of open up that line of sight for people using using the uh, launch site. Out at Bear Run Reserve, we are currently in the process of removing an old silo. This silo is in, the, in a remote corner of the reserve and away from the trail system, but the concern is that it is becoming a, a bit of an attractive nuisance. It should be down, I think, this week. Thanks to the 41 Places campaign, we are also able to acquire some really uh, very important stewardship equipment uh, like this. This is a, a seed drill. This is an attachment to a tractor that will allow us to plant native wildflower and grass seed. Such as in, to, in order to do projects like you see in this view, a couple of years ago, 2020, we planted two wildflower meadows at Bear Run. We used our own tractor to prepare the site, but then hired contractors to do the actual planting. Now that we will be acquiring the, uh, the equipment like you saw with that seed drill, we'll be able to do more of this work ourselves, which will be very, very nice. And I'll leave you with this, this last photo. This was this is what we're trying to do. This was taken the very season that we planted the meadows out at Bear Run. This is a native butterfly weed. And as you can see in the photo, just that first season, it attracted some monarchs, which is terrific. That's what we're trying to, uh, trying to enhance on our preserves. So next up is uh, Matt Merziak and Matt will give an update on some land protection activities. And Matt, as you begin, I'll say for the audience, I see we have a couple of questions in Q&A and in chat. And if others do want to ask questions about any of the presentations, feel free to put those in Q&A and then at the end, we'll be happy to answer. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking about some of our conservation work along the Clarion River. Uh, there we go. <laughs> um, so 
this is an overview of our work along the Clarin River. The Clarin River is a wonderful ecological and recreational resource. And this has been a long target of conservation for us. We've protected over 13,000 acres along the corridor. It's um, federally designated, over 50 miles, it's federally designated as wild and scenic. And the river was named uh, River of the Year in 2019. So we're very proud of the work uh, that we've done. It, it, it really made the river quite the destination it is today. We'll be focusing more on the um, Clarence River inholding property. And see, this is a view here. Um, this was one of the last large inholdings along the Clarence River that was privately owned. This, um, in fact, the, and this was a top priority for acquisition by the Allegheny National Forest. In fact, they used to refer to it as a donut hole. As you can see, it's, it's surrounded, how it is surrounded by the National Forest. And we were able to acquire this property from Forest Investment Associates in 2012. And we knew at the time that the, National for the US Forest Service was clear it would take a while um, for them to be able to acquire it from us. And it did take a while. So, um, we were able finally to convey it to their ownership last June, 2021. So this was a nine year project, pretty much spanned my entire career so far with the Conservancy, but we're really pleased to be able to get it over in into the ownership and the management of, of the National Forest. Um, it's a cool property, has a lot of features, has almost you know, two miles of frontage along the Clarence River. Big Mill Creek comes in. Uh, it's a stock trout stream that comes into at the property, has these great steep slopes, has an, as well as a plateau. Uh, a little history of the property, you know, like the, the Clarence River corridor, like a lot of the region up here has seen a lot of resource extraction and the impact from this. This is a picture of the property from the 1920s. And this is Gardner Sand company that had a sand operation on the, on the property. You can, and you can still find the uh, foundations from, from this operation. And even before then, uh, this is in the 1800s, uh, there was a lumber uh, town on the property. This is Mill Haven, the property's on the left. Um, it, and this is really the site of one of the very first dams on the Clarion. And you can see the, these structures in, in the middle of the stream is, are actually log booms. So when logs were floated down the Clarion, that's how they captured them to feed the lumber mill. But with conservation and given time, these properties do recover. This is about the same view of where Mill Haven used to be today. You can still see the remains of one of the log booms. Um, this is a beautiful property to explore, uh, particularly in the springtime when the mound laurels in bloom. Um, so when you are looking at the great mound laurel, also make sure you're watching the ground too. This has a lot of wildlife, including rattlesnakes. I ran into this rattlesnake last June, actually walking along one of the forest management roads. Uh, this is our stewardship staff on the property. Uh, actually, this is um, Andy's kids, Addie and Ethan. They were out helping him steward the property. This is about four years ago. Uh, nice, great place to explore. We hosted a, uh, I think we called it off the beaten trail, off the beaten bath walk on the property where a group of us just kind of wandered around and found these great rock formations, um, including this rock shelter, which, which was really cool. I don't know if I can ever find this again, but someday I need to get back and see if I can. And then this is a view of the Clarence River from the property. It's, you know, um, I'll end, of, end with this. This is a great place to explore. If you're up this way, stop in Ridgeway in my office, say hi and check out the Clarence and check out the Clarence Corridor. Um, so at, th at this point, I'm glad to introduce Liz Cuthbert, our uh, VA Vice President of Finance and Administration to give the finance report, the treasury report. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Now that we've heard and seen all of the fun photos of all the work that we have done during the year, it's now time for the treasurer's report. Coming off of the roller coaster year of 2020, we prepared a conservative operating budget in anticipation that the pandemic would continue on throughout 2021. As we move through the year and in planning for the upcoming fiscal year, we took steps to move towards a more normal operating budget for the conservancy. As restrictions eased during the year, we were able to operate for a full tour season at Falling Water, although the size and the timing of the tours continued to be slightly modified. And this allowed the admission and sales revenues to reclaim a larger share of the pie and reduce the amount required from our Falling Water additional invested asset sale to fund operating deficits down to only 1% of the pie. The continued support of our loyal members and donors the successful government grant writing by our program staff and the tireless efforts of our development staff have allowed us to maintain a well-diversified 
revenue stream that does not have over-reliance on any one source of funding. And the past two years is a perfect example as to why that diversification is so important. Overall, our operating expenses and the split between our program and supporting activities has remained consistent with 2020. However, as we progressed throughout 2021, we were able to slowly unwind some of the operating expense reductions that we had put in place in the prior year. From this chart, we can see that for every dollar we receive, 83 cents goes back to our programs and projects. Once again, the 2021 audit that we're about to present to the audit committee is clean with no findings or um, compliance issues, and also no management letter from our auditors with outside suggestions for improvement. Our 2021 overall operating surplus was about $3.4 million, which is mainly due to the receipt of restricted gifts last year. And I am very excited to report that we received full forgiveness from the SBA on our Paycheck Protection Program loan in the amount of $2.5 million that we had received in the prior year. And finally, our net assets as of December 31st were $121 million, which does include all of our accumulated conservation land as well as falling water. Our true endowment, which is a gift from a donor, in which the original gift must be maintained in perpetuity is 16 million, but the portion that we calculate our annual draw on is around 10.3 million. The rest of our endowment is made up of falling water and our permanent land holdings. Despite the pandemic, the markets continued to have favorable returns last year, resulting in an annual investment return of 15.3% of our investment portfolio. As a result, we continued to rank in the top quartiles through December 31st, 2021, in comparison to our peer universe of all endowments and foundations, showing that we have done a consistently good job in stewarding our funds. And finally, we have continued to maintain our four-star charity navigator rating, which demonstrates WPC's strong financial health and commitment to accountability and transparency. In the letter that we received from Charity Navigator along with our certificate, it stated that only 13% of the charities they evaluate have received at least six consecutive four-star evaluations, indicating that the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy outperforms most other charities in America. That concludes our Treasurer's Report for this year, and I will now turn the presentation back over to Carolyn. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who's uh, given us some Beautiful pictures and great information on, on some of the special projects that have been going on. We really appreciate it all. And we will go on. Um, at this time, I'll start our actual official meeting. And I need to report on um, the requirements that we need to fulfill. And then we will uh, look at the um, some reports and the report, particularly of the nominating committee so that we can elect our uh, directors for the next three years. Um, so um, we have to make sure that we are in, in compliance with our notice, our quorum and, our, and, and do our minutes at the beginning of the meeting. So the notice of the annual meeting was sent out um, by postcard and email in March, according uh, in, in accordance with the bylaws. And the bylaws state that 21 members entitled to vote must be present at the annual meeting to constitute a quorum. And a quorum is certainly present. Uh, we have uh, the, over 120, I think, people uh, at the meeting. And so on behalf of the board secretary, Bala Kumar, I'm just gonna summarize the minutes from the 2021 annual meeting, which looks pretty much like the 2022 annual meeting. Um, the 2021 annual meeting of members was held May 11th in 2021. The members elected directors to the board. CEO Tom Saunders provided an overview of the year's activities. Several staff reported on specific highlights of programs and activities since the last annual meeting, and CFO Liz Cuthbert provided a financial report for the year. 
So that's what we did last year. So next I would like to provide a report from the nominating committee. Uh, the members of the nominating committee include Mike Boyle, Dan Nidick, Steve Robinson, and me. So the bylaws of the committee uh, then nominates directors for election to the board. And at this meeting, we will elect those directors. The bios for the directors being, re re being considered for election uh, are available on WPC's website. And we have um, a number of, of board members who are being reelected and the nominating committee also met and wishes to nominate the following directors into the class of 2025. We have two very outstanding new people who have agreed to come onto our board with a lot of experience uh, in uh, the environment and in uh, all kinds of issues that are important to the con uh, conservancy and lots of activities, you know, uh, you know, on boards and in organizations. So we're really lucky to have found them. Uh, that's Gina Winstead and Paula Foradora. And the committee also nominates for re-election to the board. Many of these people have been on the board for quite some time. So Susan Fitzsimmons, uh, Dan Frankel, Bella Kumar, Josh Wetzel, and Deborah Dur Dermody. So now I need to, uh, I will make a motion from the committee uh, is that the report of the nominating committee be accepted and that each of the nominees be elected as members of the board of directors of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and serve for a period of three years. So does someone have a, a motion that uh, would, uh, would someone be willing to move this motion? Still moved. And do we have a second? Second. Okay, there is, we are doing electronic voting on the slate of officers. It's using an online poll and the poll should appear so that you can approve or oppose. And the, the uh, detail is, I mean, it, it, the, it'll be almost instantaneous. We'll get the results. <laughs> The vote is already in and the majority supports the election of these officers. So we're gonna end the poll now. Okay. I would like to thank all our directors to give their very valuable time to Conservancy's work. It's, it's, it's both very interesting, uh, very meaningful and um, a lot of fun. So we're looking forward as a board to getting together in person for the first time in a couple of years. It'll be really nice at our next board meeting. One of the other things I would like to do then at this point is to take a moment to recognize a special group of our members, uh, the Evergreen Circle. Uh, those are members who have supported WPC every year for almost 15, for, for at least, excuse me, at least 15 of the last 20 years. So that's a lot of a lot of consistency and a lot of loyalties of support. And we certainly appreciate that. Now I'd like to see if we have any questions. We, I think we have had some questions and give people an opportunity to ask the questions. Nicole will. Okay. Here's the first question. Um, I'm a member of your group as well as the French Creek Conservancy and the Foundation for Sustainable Forests. How do you work with these groups? I think Tom, you could probably answer that best. Yes, we work closely with both. So uh, in our work up in the French Creek watershed, we actually partner very heavily with the French Creek Valley Conservancy. We meet with them quarterly and uh, we do land conservation projects in that watershed, they do as well. And we sort of divide them up between the two different organizations so that we're bringing both of our resources to that. And then we're also, we also partner with the Foundation for Sustainable Forests regularly. Um, they also do some land protection projects up in that area and they have a lot of expertise in um, sustainable harvest work. And so we turn to them often for those issues. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next is about native plants. Do you have any programs to encourage people to use more locally native plants in the home and community gardens? Since we don't have somebody in our panel from the heritage program today, I could answer that one also. And yes, uh, we have um, staff who work full time on issues of invasives and then the, the corollary to that is encouraging people to use natives. So we actually did a webinar recently um, on using native plants in your backyard. And uh, Nicole, I believe you said that we have that recording on our website and people can turn to that first for information about that. Okay, um, if legislators pass a bill to allow, can the Forest Service allow the gas drilling on the land that you transfer to them? So Matt, I'll take a first stab at that and then I'll pass it to you and put you on the spot also. Um, a broad answer to that is that as we do land transactions and we pass properties along to the state, we typically do have restrictions. So if the property, if the oil, gas and minerals were controlled by the owner, then we typically either um, do prohibit um, extraction or if the um, if there are, if we can't do that, then we prohibit surface extraction. So there's no surface disturbance. And it all just depends on, on what the control situation is as we acquire a property, because sometimes the um, oil, gas, or mineral rights were severed long ago. And, um, and we just don't have the option of providing that protection. But the question specifically is about Allegheny National Forest. And there, Matt, in my experience, most of the properties we acquire in that area do have the gas rights already severed. And so as those pass along to Allegheny National Forest, they may be able to drill, um, or someone might be able to drill on those properties if they're already severed. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass to you though, because we sometimes do pass along with restrictions. Probably the state could, um, through eminent domain supersede our restrictions but the federal government could rather, but, um, but we do pass along some restricted. Yeah, and it, as, you, as you're noting, uh, most of the Allegheny National Forest, the subsurface rights are already private. When that forest was put together, um, the, the, unfortunately, the, the feds don't get control of rights, it took control privately. Specific to the Clarion River inholding, um, that property was actually owned by Seneca Resources first, before it went to Forest Investment Associates then came to us. Seneca Resources continued to own the subsurface under Clarence River and inholding. And that's one reason it took so long for us to get this done is because the Forest Service really was concerned about taking this property without having some sort of protection. And so we were able to negotiate with Sur Seneca Resources a service use agreement where they were agree agreed not to do any service disturbance within the view shed of the Clarion. So it doesn't cover the entire property, but covered about two thirds where they've agreed. Um, so there's an agreement in place that we prohibit them from doing any service disturbance from, from gas development, including pipelines, so, which was real, really important to get this done. And, um, and pretty interesting because Seneca had there's no leverage. They had no, you know, they, they did it just just because you know because we asked them to. So, but that yeah, that's the issue. Thanks, Matt. Uh, could someone describe in a little more detail the citizen scientist opportunities mentioned in the recent Perspectives newsletter? The um, IMAP Invasives, iNaturalists, and eBird networks, how are they used by WPC and about how many members use them? So if it's okay with you, Andy, I'll, I'll give you a second to think about that and turn to you on, on that one. Andy runs our stewardship work and he works closely with, with our um, heritage and conservation science staff. We do have a lot of programs that allow um, individuals to plug in their information and data and to share citizen science with us. So I'm just giving you time to think, Andy, and then you can answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll give this one a shot. So iNaturalist, IMAP Invasives, those sorts of programs are typically used by our natural heritage staff. Uh, IMAP Invasive is actually, the, the Pennsylvania IMAP Invasive is actually coordinated by one of our, one of our staffers. Uh, I know heritage staff will often use, will often go into iNaturalist to help identify some of the species that people have, have seen and entered into iNaturalist. From a stewardship standpoint, so from the standpoint of managing our own, you know, conservancy owned preserves, I will I depend on heritage staff 
when I'm making decisions about what types of management to do on our properties. So we certainly would encourage all of you to to you know to use use those those apps that we often you know that we have access to now like iNaturalist and visit visit our preserves. Use iNaturalist, you know, take those photos, enter those observations. The information will get to our heritage staff and through that avenue may may get to me as well and, and help help me make those decisions about how to manage our properties. I'd be happy to talk to anyone else sort of offline about if they're interested in specific preserves, if they're interested in using certain apps and how that could help with management of our preserves. Yeah, um, you know the, there are only so many stewardship staff. So I think you know the more information we can get about our preserves from from all of you, you know, from volunteers, from staff, uh, other staff, and, and our members would be uh, would be terrific. I, you know, I'd welcome that opportunity to to partner with some of you. I hope I answered the question. It was great. The uh, somebody on the hike was walking around with the iNaturalist um, app and snapping pictures and identifying plants. So it's a pretty useful app. It is very uh, interesting, and, I, and I've set up. I have set up iNaturalist projects, I think they're called for, um, I think there's one for Tom's Run, I think there's one for Wolf Creek Narrows, maybe one for our Helen Katz natural area. So we do have some of those projects set up and um, I'll, you know, I can talk to our heritage staff as well about how, how, how iNaturalist could be used. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, how far east does WPC serve? So I can address that. And Matt, you may have one of the more recent examples of how far east we've gone. Uh, we have no real defined eastern line. We have uh, toyed with that issue periodically. And we think it's best just to be flexible because in some places in the eastern part of the state, there are very active land trusts or other organizations that do conservation work. And so, they're there and it's best for them to do the work. But there are other places where there's really not someone local who could do it. And so we're willing to go pretty far east in our work. Matt, I know you've done a land project all the way as far east as Sullivan County. So that's something approaching two thirds of the way across the state. And our natural heritage program actually covers the whole state. It used to be that the Nature Conservancy did the east part and we did the western part, but eventually we, we uh, consumed that whole um, the nonprofit part of that program into our organization. Okay, I think that concludes the questions. If you have any other questions that you think of later, um, and there's going to be a copy of the recording, a link to the recording sent out uh, probably tomorrow, uh, please submit any questions or comments to info at paconserve.org. I'd, I'd just like to thank the panelists because your presentations are really interesting about your projects and particularly I'd like to thank all the members and donors and supporters who are joining us today and we look forward to an in-person annual meeting next spring. And this concludes then the annual meeting of membership and we really are looking forward to going to the barn at Falling Water and being outside and hiking and seeing each other and learning about the good work of the Conservancy. See you next year. <laughs>